now I'll go to the last presentation today, which is Ralph Erskine, an excellent, one of the best architects, in my opinion, of, uh, of, uh, uh, of any period, actually, but uh, um, of the 20th century, of course. And I, I plan not now, but when his birthday will happen next year to offer him the other Pritzker Prize, because I think he deserves it. So Ralph Erskine, 1914-2005, uh, he died today in 2005, March 16th. Uh, architect, well, Ralph Erskine, a British architect actually, but who lived and worked in Sweden. Uh, Ralph Erskine, a, a romantic functionalist, a romantic functionalist, he said, the first and fundamental function of architecture is to be an extension of our clothes, to protect our emaciated bodies from the climate oddness and improve the microclimate of our surrounding environment in relation with the natural one. And uh, you'll see now a few images and then we'll go in more detail uh, for some of his buildings a very versatile and interesting architect and very, very interested in ecology, what we call today ecology. Very, very interested in, in the relationship between climate and architecture. He's considered um, the master of the, the, the Arctic, Ar Arctic architecture. He lived and worked in Sweden, uh, but I think he could have built equally well in the South or in some other parts of the world. Uh, again, these are just some images and then we'll, we'll, we'll look into detail, in detail to some of his works. In my opinion, he was superior to, to some other architects who were better known than him. Um, so he died on the 16th of March in 2005 and that's why we talk about him today. He was not a formalist, but he had an artistic side which manifested itself in, 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 in various ways in his buildings. I think he was a very subtle architect. He was indeed a functionalist, but the romantic side of him made him uh, uh, move away from a, a simplistic understanding of what functionalism means. And you'll see he arrives at some very innovative uh, creative uh, um, architectures because of that openness of mind. Drawings, some drawings by him, here is the, the master seen from the back, uh, drawing manually. Uh, he didn't draw uh, digitally. This is a study for, uh, for an utopian kind of uh, uh, Nordic, um, you know, settlement, not just a building, but a cluster of buildings his own house, which we are going to see again, the same project uh, in the Arctic, an ecological Arctic town from 1958. His drawing, his manner of drawing was very, uh, you know, playful uh, and not stiff at all. So Ralph Erskine, British architect, but living and working in Sweden. This was his house, his own house, and you are going to see it, a very modest house, a small house. Uh, another drawing of his house. Uh, the house itself is, is here, but in his case, the building also connected and connects with what is around it. His, uh, the first private home in Stockholm is his own house, and you just saw drawings of it. And uh, it, it, it's just one room, actually. Uh, it's kind of as small as the Le Cabanon by Le Corbusier, uh, but uh, it's, 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 it's truly architecture, maybe with a capital A, although it is just one room, actually. And look, one side. So the, 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 this is the main elevation, and the back elevation is very interesting. The, the wood that he stored in order to be able to warm up the, the, the space, uh, it becomes uh, part of the building, the, almost the artistic expression of the building. A very nice idea is both functional and also aesthetically intriguing.
the Scandinavians are usually excellent at employing wood. They know how to work with wood, to design with wood. Now another villa from another building from 1961, um, a larger building, and you are going to see, this is how he built it with um, exposed concrete. Uh, it was uh, refurbished later on, and you are going to see also the images, uh, uh, the later on uh, images after, after it was refurbished. A dense plan, you know, uh, uh, it, it's not dispersed because in the in the cold climate you are supposed to save energy, and so the building better is, uh, you know, condensed. And this is how it looks like now after the, after it was um, you know uh, refurbished. I have a question. Please. Uh, you said earlier that... Um, uh, I don't was, hear very well, please. Uh, you said earlier that you were interested in, in ecology, but yes. how does using the concrete help with ecology? Well, uh, your question is, uh, is, uh, is legitimate, but the problem is this man built 60, 70 years ago. At that time, the, the conception about you know, relating to the climate and even, even maybe even the word ec ecological or ecology was barely used, if at all. Uh, we use it now. It's true. Concrete is not a, a material that uh, that is kind to 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 the climate. But at that time, you know, uh, they didn't have, and he didn't have the 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 knowledge, maybe even, and the conceptions that we have today. Your, your question is excellent. He was, he was concerned very much with, with climate, but uh, he still used concrete, yes. He didn't use just concrete, it's true. But even today, although we know that the concrete is not good at all uh, for, for uh, pollution, uh, for, for, for the climate, we still use it. So, you know, the truth is any constructive gesture almost any any kind of constructive gesture, any any act that is constructive, any coming into being of a building is, we want it or not, uh, not totally ecological because even our presence on Earth, we are a nuisance for nature. You know, we are uh, there is a tension between man and nature, and yes, we have to diminish. Uh, the negative impact of ourselves on the earth. That, that is the ideal. But uh, I think if the pandemic goes away, but even with the pandemic, we do not stop. We continue to build like crazy, higher and higher, wider and wider, and uh, keep neglecting the, you know, uh, the climate or nature in, in good measure. An Arctic town, uh, we, well, sorry about that. Another villa, Villa Erskine. He built this one later. Uh, in, in, in this is a second building he built for himself after he probably got married or he had a family. The first building was just one room for himself. Here is a, is a building uh, for 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 a family. But even this one is not. I don't think it's a you know an arrogant building is or need not even a very big building for a successful architect. And he built a lot. Uh, another villa from This is a, a complex of buildings. It's an, a, a row of, of uh, individual units, individual houses. A little bit uh, maybe too strict. This this row, you know, there are too many buildings and they're all alike. But they have something uh, almost, uh, you know, uh, I mean, something Scandinavian. This austere. Uh, architecture towards the, the outside and, and then uh, the, the, the house is open towards the courtyard. 
they are a little bit teutonic for my taste is true but uh, i wouldn't say it's a, it's an architecture that leaves you indifferent but it is a little bit uh, less free than other works a little bit militaristic for for my taste but interesting nevertheless um, This is an excellent work in Stockholm. Aula Magna is, is, uh, is for a university. And I like the fact that it's not monolithical. Is, uh, is, uh, there are many fragments. I mean, there is uh, also the, the brickwork is, uh, is, it shows a lot of versatility and diversity, reminding one of the, the experimental house that Alvar Alto built for himself and his second wife. Uh, but this is a public building that look at this, it, it is a public building, but it's not, it's not uh, monolithical. It's, uh, uh, it has variety, all the, these movements of, of various parts of the building is interesting. And also uh, at the level of uh, the texture of the, of the wall, this is also illustrated by the, the variety of you know, designs and placements of, of the bricks that he worked with. So the wall is not uh, blunt, it's, it's, it, has, it has texture, it has richness. And that richness I think is shown also at the level, I hope I have uh, some images also seen from a little bit uh, far away, like here. I, I like this work very much and it's not easy to do something like this, you know, because an aula, an auditorium is essentially a big room, but but he's able to, 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 to kind of hide the big room behind this facade, which is uh, almost medieval in its, uh, uh, you know, uh, conglomerate like, um, you know, uh, uh, adding up various parts. And it, it, I think it's, it, it's a very good work. You see the, the, the aula itself is a mono room, is a monolithical, uh, interior space, but uh, the, the outside is something else. I think it kind of reiterates the, the idea of a medieval fortress or something. Yes, I think you put it very well. Yes, the, 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 the medieval fortress, yeah. I think this is a kind of surprise. Uh, pardon? Surprise, I think. Surprise? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it is, but... Um, no, I, I think he's one of his best works, this Aula. Not so much the interior, but uh, anyway, the London Arc. This is also an excellent work, and it shows that you can do an office building uh, in a city like London that is so very different from all the other office uh, buildings uh, built in, in, in London, you know, and you know, I can refer to the most famous towers by Foster and Associates. And I think the, the building by, by uh, Ralph Erskine is, uh, is superior, actually. I, without knowing enough about the distribution of functions and how he arrived at certain uh, uh, design decisions relating to those functions, but the building, the first impression I have is that it has a complexity which most office towers uh, do not uh, address. And I, I don't think he played here with, with, with forms or not totally or not completely because uh, I think that there is here drawing a section where we can look at, at, at various uh, relationships between the forms he employed and the functions he tried to, um, to address. It's a, it's a machine in a way, it's an organism, it's a mechanical organism, but it has a certain, even viscerality, I would say, especially at the interior. And uh, I, I, I think, I mean, I didn't study carefully, but maybe I should, and maybe I could. Uh, I know there is a drawing and I hope I have it in this presentation. I, I made three presentations on him and I hope that drawing is in this, in this one. Um, where we can see, you know, uh, the trajectory of the sun, uh, how the winds blow here. 
you know, uh, if we have the, the patience to read and the ability to read, I think he, he, he tried to, to, to honor, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the commandments of, of, of climate and the environment as much as possible through his building. And uh, now to what extent he achieved this, you know, is for others to say who know this building better and who maybe use it. I don't think that he completely disregarded form. I mean, from my perspective, it kind of looks like a, a ship with uh, many levels and Well, yes, but um, uh, we see here all kinds of uh, indications that he was uh, concerned with uh, the flow of air, with, uh, uh, and I think there is another drawing. I hope I hope I have it here, uh, where it's shown also the trajectory of the sun and. Uh, I know he's he's very well known as being an architect with who many years before uh, our explicit concerns today with ecology address such concerns, not perfectly, but uh, the attempt was there for the for for buildings built in the north. Okay, what is this from Newcastle? This is a housing complex and unusual in many respects. Really, how many housing complexes in the world today look like this? I mean, you know, a certain form of aesthetics that relate to some kind of a medieval fortress appear here as well. But look at the windows. Gone is the, the obsession with the demagogy of glass you know, with large surfaces of glass. Instead, we have very small windows scattered on the wall. Um, uh, then then the, the use of color, the, 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 the fact that he actually used ornament as well. This is also something, uh, I mean, I don't know exactly when this was built, 1968. Well, who would use ornament in 1968? Look here, it's, it's a tapestry, it's an architectonic rug on the facade of the building. I mean, he was an innovator, he was radical. First for using very small windows and scattered freely on the, on the, on the facade. This was not done at that time, you know, now we do it with, uh, it, it is done, but still to include such large scale ornaments on the facade is, is, is not done and he did it. To me, this is a very innovative and almost radical architecture that he did in 1968. Um, and we'll see is a complex uh, uh, cluster of buildings. This is just one of them. And, uh, and uh, you know, if we study it in detail, I'm sure we can discover other things that at a superficial first reading uh, we cannot notice. You know, this, this building and this building is the same, but there are the two sides of the building. Uh, here we have sunlight and, you know, uh, these balconies that are, I think he was indeed a serious architect who was very concerned with uh, functionalism, which didn't neglect the relationship between the building and the outside. Maybe he didn't always achieve what he wanted to achieve, but uh, I, I, I see him as a, a non-formalist, actually, although he ha had the ability to be sculptural or artistically interesting. 
look, this building also in the same complex of building, different from this, and also the, the unusual colors he used. You know, it shows that he was, uh, uh, Ralph Erskine was, uh, was uh, at the level of chromatics also, uh, you know, quite uh, adventurous. I mean, this is almost expressionistic to an extent. And all these buildings are built by him. And you see that they are not dogmatic. They, they have a variety here that, that is easily perceivable. So this is built in England, not in Sweden, but he, all, all of this was done by him. Uh, and most of his work otherwise is in, in, in Sweden. So most of, most of the, I mean, even if, if we compare his work with the work of those people who got the Pritzker Prize today, Lacan and Vassal, we see a much richer and more complex architecture here. Uh, you know, richly chromatic, the, the forms are very different. There is no dogma here, really. Uh, there is a lot of variety. And this was done, you know, more than 50 years ago. I find him a very interesting architect and uh, not part of the star system. Now we arrive at a different kind of work in Sweden, a small cluster of, of uh, private units, private houses, also very interesting, but different from what we saw in, in, in England. And, and there is here also something teutonical, but look at these houses, you know, they are oriented towards each other. They are individual, they are distinct, but also this, uh, this part at the top uh, you know, creates a certain level of um, exaltation that is not very common in, in uh, domestic architecture. So we have individual houses that uh, are also connected in between them. So it's a, like a dance of various dancers. And then we have a, a kind of a courtyard, a collective uh, space, uh, communal space, and then the houses, as I said, have this uh, strange uh, thing at the top, this part of the roof, which uh, gives them, I think, uh, uh, an, an additional uh, uh, element in terms of expression. Maybe a little bit exaggerated, but uh, maybe a little bit idiosyncratic, but I think they are nice, uh, these houses. and. Uh, I, I like the fact that, you know, they are individual units, but there is also a sense of um, commun commun com communality, of, 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 of the houses belonging to each other, although they are, you know, clearly perceivable as individual units. And even here we see the sculptor, the architect who has a, a, a taste, uh, a liking for uh, sculptural forms. 
On the other hand, I'm sure the houses are very comfortable and there is, uh, you know, there, are, there is plenty of wood here. I think it's an interesting, uh, another interesting work by Ralph Erskine. Erskine. And that so-called medieval quality seems to be present here as well. Residential area in Tibro. This is a different kind of uh, housing complex, uh, more explicitly communal, uh, but and, and very, very different from what we just saw. And this is also interesting that the same architect who did this, did this. <laughs> 